everybody. Welcome to the sixth episode of Drive Through FM. Uh, this is for September 2017, and I'm trying to get the cobwebs out of my board game reviewer brain. I've been on vacation uh, for about a week in uh, Los Angeles, California, and then when I got back, I was spending some time redoing my video studio gaming room type of thing. So I haven't uh, been in front of a microphone in front of a camera for a couple of weeks now. Uh, the two reviews I posted last week were actually recorded before vacation, uh, just so I could give myself a little buffer in terms of the content output. And then I dropped them when I got back. And I've been busy since also catching up with my normal real life job. Uh, so dovetailing into that, there are going to be some changes to how I'm going to approach the podcast and the podcast feed itself. If you notice, I did not drop the two reviews that I posted for Frog Riders and Mini Rails into the podcast feed. I figured what I can kind of do is do kind of a brief summary synopsis review of any of the board game reviews that I've done up until that point. I'll kind of do like, you know, hey, what have you been playing? What's been happening? Well, I'll just kind of use that sort of traditional or proverbial uh, intro piece to cover the games that I've recently reviewed for those folks that uh, do prefer to listen to stuff on the podcast. And I've gotten a lot of requests over the last several years, frankly, to put reviews on the audio side, but I don't really see how like the rules explanation and walkthrough stuff is that useful in an audio format because you know my verbs and everything that I'm using, the way I'm describing the game, you really need to see the components for that. And if I ever do playthroughs, which I plan on doing more of, frankly, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but that's not really going to translate to the podcast. So I felt there was kind of a schism there in terms of what content I was dropping into the feed itself. But I don't want to sort of ignore those folks that, you know, podcasting is kind of the way they consume content in their car, which is what I do, and or maybe at work or whatever. So I want to sort of use both and then maybe kind of quickly go over games that I've reviewed uh, and maybe folks that do watch the channel, they can kind of catch up and say, oh, I missed that. He dropped that review on Tuesday or whatever. So to start with, let's jump into those two reviews quickly and then we'll jump into some uh, other changes and things that are going to happen. So the first one is a Frog Riders from Stronghold Games. And this is a very much a gateway level game. Uh, it's used these uh, little toads with gnomes on them that jump around. And the theme's really interesting. It's like they've gotten rid of war and combat of any sort, and now they settle their differences with an annual frog rider slash frog jumping competition. Now, what you do is you have these different candy-colored frogs that you jump over uh, other frogs with, and it's kind of like checkers in that way. So you jump, use one frog to jump over another, and you collect the frog that you jumped over. Sometimes you can actually collect the frog that you used to jump uh, if you have a special ability, but regardless, you collect some kind of frog, and then you can spend the frog uh, and different colored frogs will have different special abilities that you can do to collect cards that give you scoring points and special abilities, or maybe allow you to do an extra jump and stuff like that. So the game takes about 30 to 45 minutes. And the real trick of it is, is spending a little bit of time collecting different frogs because you're gonna score those sets of frogs at the end of the game, but you also wanna turn them in to use a special ability. So there's a real kind of balancing act between collecting different sets uh, based on what kind of scoring cards were dealt at the beginning of the game. And you're trying to do that versus turning them in and getting the special abilities and activating them. So it's a little bit kind of an engine building type of idea. So it's a real kind of cool balancing act between those two things. Uh, very, very straightforward in a lot of ways. And the way that you get dealt special scoring cards and special ability cards come out, that's going to kind of change up your strategy. It is more strategic for sure when you're playing with two players versus four players, which is the max count. Uh, the board kind of changes too much to really plan that much with four players, but it's I would still have fun with it playing a four-player game. So I definitely recommend this for folks that are looking for kind of a gateway-style game, maybe a family game kind of idea. A really pretty, really go cool components. Uh, so that's Frog Riders from Stronghold. Now the second game that I reviewed last week is Mini Rails. And this is currently published by Moidius Game Design, but I heard from a little birdie and I think it's true, is that Tasty Minstrel is actually going to be bringing this game over in more prevalence to the United States uh, at some point, maybe next year. 
So this is a very, very, very abstract train game. Uh, you have these different discs that are placed around at sort of the edge of the board. Those represent different train companies. And then players get two actions per turn. And there's a really interesting kind of turn order thing that I don't really want to explain <laughs> audio-wise, but visually, if you watch the review, you get a good sense of it. It's really interesting how it works. And so during the course of a round, you're going to take turns out of different orders. So you're not always going to you know, do your two actions in the same order. But basically, you can do one action to buy stock and then the other action you can do is to actually to sort of expand the train so very very simple elegant all that kind of cool stuff there's different sort of terrain on the board it's like different hexes so the board's going to be different so sometimes going into certain areas will improve the overall worth of the train company and going into other areas will decrease it so you can interact with any of the companies uh, that are currently on the board and so you can buy stock in anything, you can move and expand train companies of companies that you don't even own and stuff like that. So you can really tank other players. Uh, and so it's just 12 rounds, excuse me, yeah, six rounds. And so you get 12 actions over the course of those six rounds. And what you're really trying to do is sort of hedge your bets and say, okay, I, you always have to take stock in something and you always have to expand something. You can't like buy twice or expand twice in your turn. You're always having to do one or the other. So you're trying to really hedge your bets and not get too invested in a company that looks like might move through negative terrain that's going to you know, adversely affect your value. Uh, so, and you, then you're trying to obviously move other companies in a way that's favorable to you and unfavorable to other players. So it's really, really quick, 30, 45 minutes tops with a maximum uh, player count. Uh, and it's really kind of difficult to explain the elegance and why it's so fun I think if you kind of watch the video not to plug my own stuff but if you watch that the very simple rule set I think you get a good sense of oh I can kind of see the cleverness here in terms of the mechanics and everything so it's definitely got a, a good handful of plays in it and it's one of those nice kind of chunky filler games that's really going to uh, provide a, I think a kind of a satisfying kind of a meal flavor to it but in a very, very, very short time frame. So definitely take a look at Mini Rails. Great components, uh, you know, nice color and very functional design and everything. Very easy to read rule book and everything. So I definitely recommend uh, Mini Rails, especially once it gets brought over here. So that's really what I've been playing lately. Uh, like I said, I'm trying to get back into the swing of things. I've got a game of First Martians planned to play here in a couple of days. I've also been playing a game called Rumble Slam from a very unknown publisher. It's a kind of a miniature game, but it's also a board game. Uh, it's basically kind of tag team cage match wrestling with sort of fantasy figures. Really, really fun game. I can already give you kind of a recommendation on that. And I'm going to do a playthrough of Rumble Slam. I'll do a playthrough and a follow-up review with it. So I'm really excited to talk about that. And that kind of dovetails into the other change that's been going on in terms of everything here. The podcast is going to change slightly, like I said. And I'm also in this new room here, and I'm super excited. Uh, a couple of years ago, or maybe a year and a half ago, my oldest son moved out. Uh, he's living with his fiance. They have a baby. He lives in Montana, and he works out there and works in North Dakota, frankly, and then she works in Montana. So they've moved out. They've been out a while now, and they're doing well and uh, able to sustain. You know you know how it is if you're young. I was 20 lazy 22 now so it's tough to kind of get rolling but hopefully once you get rolling you can keep that and sustain that so they've been able to sustain uh incomes from the both of them and care for their son and so now i have stolen his room <laughs> and converted it to kind of a solely exclusive uh gaming room and a studio so i have now this awesome table that i'm sitting here looking at while i record it it's from game toppers and I'm going to do a video on this very soon. It's probably the first video that you might see uh, on the channel here. And this is a very cool concept. I can't wait to show it on video. What it is, is it looks like a fancy uh, gaming chic type of table. But it's going to be very, very affordable. And all it is, is as the name says, is game toppers. So this is actually a table that I can break down, put back up, store away in a couple of pieces and then put it back up and so on. So if I need to clear out this room to 
to maybe have guests over or do something kind of funky, I can break it down, pack it away, put it to the side, and then break it back out. And it takes just a couple of minutes to do it. I can't tell you how sturdy and awesome this stuff looks. I really can't wait to do it. So, But the other nice thing about that for me personally is I'm going to be able to have this game table, this great game table, which I could never afford, and leave games set up. And so I plan to do a lot more playthroughs. In my head, you know, I'll take some feedback on this, but in my head, I kind of just want to do playthroughs because the trouble with playthroughs is they take longer to shoot than a review does. And a review, arguably, depending on how you edit stuff, is going to take longer to edit than a playthrough. Now, the way I do playthroughs in editing, it takes about the same amount of time. It kind of depends on the length of the playthrough. But the nice thing is I can set something up, like a longer game even, and record for a couple hours and then leave it and it's not going to get touched and then I can come back to it the next night or whatever and do that kind of cool stuff. So I'm really excited about that and it's it's a large, you know, t gaming space. It's about uh, this table here is about 6 by f 4 t roughly, I don't remember the exact inches. So I'm be able to let, leave out like a lot of stuff. I could easily fit, you know, the War of the Ring collector's edition on this table or maybe throw down a couple of boards and leave out like a Warhammer uh, game, a full 2000 point Warhammer game set up here. So I'm really excited, not only about the kind of the table space, but just kind of the studio space as well. I can leave cameras set up. I can throw up another light. Uh, I can, you know, have my camera equipment with the different fancy little cables and gadgets or whatever. That's all got its own space. I don't have to tear it down and take it up because before I was in the office, that space that we have downstairs, which is much smaller than this uh, bedroom. And you know, I shared that with the kids, with my wife. My wife does uh, choreography for her fitness classes. And so that's that was definitely a shared uh, family space. And so that is a, puts a little bit of a cramp in terms of the easeability of, you know, getting stuff set up and you know, you can just imagine all that stuff. Uh, so this is gonna be really good. I'm, I'm excited to just kind of have this space to just sit and play in and kind of do uh, whatever, you know, whatever I feel like doing. So I'm the freedom, that is going to happen now uh, really has me uh, kind of re-energized in terms of you know w what I can do and all that fun stuff so I'm excited <laughs> just to kind of cut to the point there so you might see a little bit of the room um, in the game toppers preview video they are going to have that on kickstarter I think probably less than a week after you hear this podcast and I'll definitely have my uh, review video uh, or preview video going up uh the day that the Kickstarter launches. He did provide the tabletop for me, uh, so he's given me that to keep, uh, which you know I'm over the moon about, because it's once you see it, you're gonna see this is a fantastic piece of craft and, uh, and uh, art <laughs> in some ways. There's a lot of cool things I'm not even talking about now, I'm gonna save for that. But then I'll also do a kind of a video uh, of the room and all that stuff, which maybe isn't that interesting, but I'm thinking what I might do, because everybody asked me to do a top 100 list uh, during the course of this room transformation I've done some culling and moving around and organization of my games so I might just not might I'm gonna do this at some point it might be a separate video or a companion video but I'm gonna break down everything on my shelf and just kind of quickly go through everything that I kept and why and just be real brief things about the different games that I have uh, I did that a couple of years ago prior to my top 100 list and folks seem to really like that uh, I know Tom Vassell and Richard Ham did that way back when as well. And I think p folks really seem to like that. And it's kind of a top 100 if you think about it. Because 100, top 100, top 50, those are just kind of arbitrary numbers. It's like, hey, what's on your shelf? What did you keep? There, That's what you, you know, why'd you keep it? That's really the trick there. So it's just not really in, in any order. Um, but frankly, you know, those lists are good for a lot of reasons. But the one thing that a list in terms of you know 100 through one misses out on is hey I kept this one uh, you know like I'm looking at Stop Thief now and Stop Thief is sitting next to uh, Caverna and Battle Lore and Forbidden Stars so those are all different style of games and I keep them for all different kind of reasons for different folks that I play it with so that kind of stuff uh, you kind of miss out with and so I've got the game shells organized and I'll kind of do a video or a companion video with that as well so I'm excited to kind of do that and kind of uh, share everything uh, that I've kept. So, kind of moving on to the quote-unquote meat of the episode, and <laughs> I'm using this selfishly as a way to kind of clear the cobwebs of my 
uh, reviewer analytical mind, and I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about some games that I will blacklist here. And so if you're new to that term for me, every so often, maybe twice a year at most, I'll go through some games that I've played and not reviewed, but I didn't really care for. And I know blacklist, as time has gone by, when I first used it, it was a very derogatory term. But lately, it's been, sometimes it's derogatory. Like there's a couple of games on here that I really just don't like. But there's others that I'm like, yeah, I don't care for it, but I totally see how a good chunk of people would care for it. So th these other games will kind of fall into that as well. So let's just kind of jump in and I'm gonna work it from stuff I care for the least to stuff that I could see, you know, maybe I can kind of see the merit in the game or I can, not maybe, I can see the merit in the game, but I just didn't work for me. So the first one, and this is uh, seven games that I'm gonna talk about, is Lovecraft Letter. Now, I'm a big fan of Love Letter. I've liked every version. I've played The Hobbit, Batman, I played the Love Letter Premium Edition, which is my favorite, either that one or the Batman one. And I've liked them all, and it's very simple, very easy to get into. We've had a good time with them at lunch. Sometimes we can't figure out what we wanna play. Bam, throw out Love Letter or Splendor, and then we're good to go. Now, Lovecraft Letter I was kind of excited about because on paper, the mechanics seemed very, very interesting to me. You could get Cthulhu, and you could try to win the whole game with Cthulhu uh, all in one, or one hand. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole mess of sort of uh, like dark side cards, you know, sort of mirror cards for all of the traditional love letter cards. And so that's kind of interesting, but I gotta be honest, eventually at the end of the game, at the end of the round, it just feels super random the way things uh, shake out. You can have some slightly interesting interactions with some of the different character abilities and stuff like that, but it, when you start to go insane, there's an effect that allows you to go insane once you play kind of one of those dark mirror cards. It's you, Then you flop some cards over the top and then if you get an insane card, then you're out and it's like, ugh. That little wrinkle there just really sours the game for everybody that I played it with. We gave this one the good college try. I mean, we played it um, a lot more than I usually play a game if I don't initially like it. And uh, it's because it's so quick and we're stuck at lunch with each other. So, uh, you know, we played it several times and it just really didn't work out at all. And I'm that I say that as somebody as a fan of Love Letter. So that was the, oh, there's actually eight games. I said there were seven a second ago. So that was number eight, I guess, Lovecraft Letter, working down. Uh, then the next one here, uh, number seven this time, is a Lost Expedition from Osprey Games. This one, I must be missing something because I played this three times and it feels so random to me. And it feels like it wants to be like an Oniram or one of those other shady Torby games from Z-Man games. Gorgeous components, fantastic artwork on the cards. I really like the theme of it, but I felt like I just didn't really have much control over what was happening. There's some things you can do as you kind of like walk through these cards to kind of get through this you know, jungle that you can do to kind of mitigate the bad stuff that's gonna happen. But at the end of the day, I, I just didn't feel like I had enough control to really manipulate, uh, you know, avoiding the traps and things that the cards would present to me. You know, it gives you some different resources that you can manage in terms of health and, and bullets and stuff like that. But man, I, I must be missing something because everything I've seen like on Twitter and some other folks, reviewer folks that I've talked to uh, that have played it, they're just enamored with it and they love it. And it's just like, man, I, I must be missing something. But like I said, I gave it you know a couple more plays and it just did not work out for me. Now this game is probably cheap enough that you could probably ignore everything I just said and check it out because it is really a gorgeous looking game. And I should say Osprey's done you know, a fantastic job lately with all of their games. Uh, but man, this one just really missed for me. And then moving on to number six, this is a Goonies Adventure card game. Now this is a game that I can kind of recommend if you're a Goonies fan. I'm not the biggest Goonies fan, and I don't know that many kids today are Goonies fans, although I don't know if my kids watched Goonies. I can't remember if, if we watched that or not. Gosh, but I don't imagine there's a lot of younger kids that are Goonies fans, especially without their parents showing them the movie. But 
I think kids would like this because it's very, very simple, but that's why I don't really like it. And maybe it's designed to be that way and I can see that, but there's some interesting stuff you can do with working through the cards and everything, but it just sort of feels like it plays itself a lot. Uh, so that's why I kind of just soured on it. Um, it's kind of the opposite of Lost Expedition in a way because it just kind of does its thing and you just kind of work through it. It's not really difficult. I mean, you can use kind of the more advanced stuff on the backs, but uh, it just really was a very flat game. I mean, you have to be a giant Goonies fan, I think, to really enjoy this one, and I'm not. So I maybe missed out on some of the uh, thematic to mechanical you know, interactions or something like that. Again, it's just one of those really vanilla vanilla games. I didn't feel like there was anything kind of inspiring or anything about it. It was just kind of, here's some you know, co op -y stuff that feels sort of like Pandemic on a real surface level, and then that's it. And there, there you go, you can work through that. And I was like, man, I've seen this so many times, and it just has Goonies artwork on it. So yeah, not, not terrible, not a bad design, but I think maybe targeted for somebody other than me for maybe a smaller audience or somebody that's a huge uh, Goonies fan. So that was Goonies Adventure Card Game. Uh, number five, this game was so close to me liking it. And this is a World Championship Russian Roulette. Really crazy theme. Uh, basically, each player has a team of uh, roulette champions. And you sit around the table with other players who have their own team. And then you have this little deck of cards that you can sort of sometimes take the bullet out of or you leave the bullet in and you shuffle up the cards and then you kind of bid how many trigger pulls you can get before blowing somebody's brains out. Now the theme is going to be off-putting I think of course to several people. Uh, this, it's kind of kind of a dark humor so I, I appreciate that stuff. Um, but then there's also these kind of special ability cards that you can get and I would say half of those are interesting. The other half to me kind of go, they cross the line in terms of the amount of randomness that I kind of want and expected, you know, through the few plays that we tried of the game. Uh, there's certain things like you'll go through the deck and you can use them as a way to kind of bluff that you actually took the bullet out of the gun. Because as I said, you can, you can maybe remove the bullet from the gun and then people can call you on it. And then if you get caught doing it, then you get a penalty and then if they call you on it and you didn't take the bullet out then they get a penalty and stuff and then there's other cards and stuff that come in that kind of affect that metagame and that part's really really neat because you're like okay he's acting because he bids so high like he said he could pull the trigger five times or whatever he's acting like he took the bullet out but probably he's got this card that allows him to sort of negate the bullet actually being in the gun and so you've got that kind of work to work with but that's cool but then the actual effects of a lot of cards, eesh, they're just like, some of them are just not fair. You know, I mean, I know it's Russian Roulette World Championship. So there's there's that part of it. But some of them are just like, ah, so I can point the gun at you and you're like, well, I'm out of the round already. I'm safe. And then you get shot. And then other ones is like, everybody points the guns up in the air or whatever. You point left or point right. That kind of stuff just really sort of deflates the... Uh, that kind of cool poker face metagame stuff that goes on with the whole bidding versus, you know, do they have a card that lets, allows them to work through it? So I hate to like Monday morning quarterback on these things, but I feel like if the card effects were just something different, then the game would be really, really cool. But as it were, it's just like, ugh, God, you just, you just randomly had a cool card and got it. And it's like, yeah, that's okay. I don't hate that on the surface, but it, to me, it just didn't really sink in with the game. Um, so that's World Championship Russian Roulette. I say give that one a shot. I could see, for lack of a better word, like a beer and pretzels type atmosphere playing this game for, for just giggles. Uh, but yeah, it just fell flat for me. So that was World Championship Russian Roulette. Now the next one is a Dark Souls, uh, the board game. And this is another one that was close but the reason it's close is because of the miniatures. Now the miniatures are amazing. They're right up there with like Cool Mini or Not, who to my money, it's either Cool Mini or Not or Games Workshop is, has the best miniatures in the game, or in the business. Um, these miniatures were right up there with the Cool Mini or Not, you know, single mold injected plastic, but tons of detail and just crazy horrific creatures, which is perfect for Dark Souls, 
because you know the type of uh, monsters and bosses in there but that's really the only thing I liked about it it has this strange concept of carrying over like the grind and the repetition and the unfairness of the video game which I've not played I played Bloodborne which I can't stand that game it's because I'm bad just don't want to punish myself uh you know like i think back in the day playing ghouls and ghosts or castlevania or two or whatever the hard one was or ninja gaiden <laughs> back on the nintendo yeah and i did that enough when i was like you know eight or something or ten and uh yeah i don't need to do that anymore uh so anyway back to the review at hand here the dark souls game it just gets into the point where it feels very very samey where you're rolling rolling tons and tons and tons of dice and it just feels like you're very at the whim of that. And then you maybe finally get something and you get a treasure and it's just like worthless and it doesn't really affect the kind of the scope or the narrative arc of the game, if that makes any sense. So you just kind of do the same thing again. It's like, oh, okay, now I've got a cool treasure. Okay, now we're we're moving along and, and, and things are, you know, I'm able to kill some stuff now. It's like, well, it's just because I had this treasure. So that like, once you kind of get over that initial hump of, uh, you know the cool coolness factor the game like really fast it just fell apart and i was like ah this is too bad because it seems like this again with the monday morning quarterbacking but it seems like if they would have just tweaked something to make it not feel like the progression was random like i like the sort of progression and maybe i could get into the repetition but that you could get a, a session that takes forever to play and you can have other sessions where it's just you know really quick and it's done so it felt like that it just wasn't like fine tuned and focused uh, enough of a design there. Uh, so it's kind of disappointing because they I mean, man, they really delivered, I think, on terms of uh, the production and kind of where they were starting to go with the design. But yeah, it just I don't want to put myself through that. And I kind of felt like I was, again, kind of putting myself through this grind over and over and over again. So that's the Dark Souls board game. I would say pick this up for the miniatures and use them in the role playing game because you can get I think the base box you know reasonably cheap for the amount of miniatures and stuff that you get in it and you get a game that you can toy around with but yeah I got to say the miniatures are outstanding I hope the uh, Steam Forged uh, you know continues to create games I know they came out with Guild Ball which I love and uh, this game and I know they're coming out with some other stuff so I hope they keep at it because there's definitely promise here with what they've come out with so far. Okay, so the next three are the ones that they are going to cause me pain <laughs> to actually, uh, you know, kind of put in this list here. Uh, so the next one is One Night Ultimate Alien. Now, One Night Ultimate Werewolf, especially when you add in Daybreak and even the Vampire expansion, are is like my top five games of all time. Love them. Love them to death. Uh, I may even actually like Werewords better. Uh, Werewoods is fantastic. Now, One Night Ultimate Alien is really, really, really fun during the course of the game. The you know you have the night phase, you do all the different effects, and then the discussion that comes out of it is cool. But then the winner seems like it's always just some random confluence of just like oh oh okay so he's this one's dead and this one and you had this. And you were, you know, converted. Okay, so Billy won. Okay. So it just is like the winner's always random. And it's like, oh, man. So, you know, I'm going to keep it. I have, like, the collector's box with all the stuff. So I'm not going to get rid of it, obviously. But it's just like, no, I don't want to play that. You know, this might be one that we break out if we're <laughs> really bored or something. Because it's kind of cool in some way. But I think if you if you didn't like One Night Ultimate anything then there's no way you would like Alien. And if you really like all the one nights and where words and stuff, the chances that you would like Alien, I think, are probably slim. I could see some people liking this. And I think with my group, I didn't take a poll or anything, but we had kind of a you know informal discussion. We're all like, yeah, I don't know. This is kind of, it's cool. But then at the end, like you just, whoever wins is random kind of feeling. So yeah, I don't know. I just, I can't really recommend this one. <laughs> so anyway, I apologize for that. I don't know why I'm apologizing. I just, it's just, I don't like the game. That's all. Um, but yeah, that's one I would stay away from. I definitely de recommend, you know, One Night Ultimate Werewolf and definitely Werewords. Uh, Werewords I can recommend to 
I think everybody. I mean, I think most people will enjoy Werewords, even if you don't like the other One Night games or even like games like The Resistance and stuff. Uh, so that's One Night Ultimate Alien. Uh, the next one is Near and Far. Now, this is uh, this one is sort of unfair because I really liked Above and Below. Very cool, like a Euro with a splash of Tales of the Arabian Nights, and that would have some kind of effect on the game. It was a very kind of light hand, though, with the storytelling. Just kind of a brief... It was almost like you're taking a little bit of a break from the game to tell each other a little story, and then you get some kind of you know bonus resource or work or something like that out of it. That was really cool. So I was really excited for Near and Far because it was going to introduce sort of a legacy campaign, more of a campaign than a legacy kind of thing, sort of a campaign aspect, and you would have sort of your town phase, and then you go out and quest on an adventure and everything like that. And the town phase was, it's okay, it's, it's pretty cool. And then you go on the adventure, and I don't like that at all. I just don't like, uh, gosh, it doesn't feel right. And to me, the, the whole like movement and, you know, like leaving your little trail and then jumping around and, and going to these different locations to uh, inspect or, you know, do a quest, that kind of stuff, and the kind of the race of that, the balance of, of, you know, kind of managing your resources, getting ready to go on your adventure, and then you go out and you do the quest. Uh, I don't know. I just, after a while, like just the movement, sometimes you do a turn, you just like, just move and that's it. And that was just, you know, not, not that fun. And so it just feels like there's something kind of missing there. And it like, it seems like I thought that would be my favorite part where, you know, you open up, there's a book and it has like a little map on it. And, you know, you move your character around and you can, you start off in the town and then you start to move through and there's certain locations that are marked and they're gonna, you know, reference quests, and sometimes that's gonna be directly related to the story. And there's some kind of advancement and stuff like that. And all those kind of concepts in my head seem really, really fun. But it just, it just, again, one of those again, it just fell flat. Like I don't think the design is bad or anything like that. But it, and it's almost like this is where I come down. I was like, man, I'd rather just play above and below because it, to me, that was a more interesting resource management uh, euro kind of thing was a very cool like just hey let's take a break from this euro and we're gonna play uh tell a story and it's gonna have some impact on you know the game and stuff but it was just a the perfect kind of soft touch with both of those and it was a little bit more focused i thought on the euro side of it on the resource management and the conversion of all the resources this one i don't know i felt like there was just kind of a little bit maybe this one it was a little bit too soft on everything because it's like, here's a little bit of exploration and a little bit of questing, a little bit of Euro stuff, a little bit of character advancement. So it just, maybe it watered it down too much or something. It's, it's kind of hard to put my finger on. But at the end, I just kept playing, man, I would just rather just play a single game of Above and Below. And I don't know if it's one of those where maybe the campaign idea, maybe that, that sort of is like pulling the design in a certain direction that it doesn't, doesn't want to go or I don't want it to go. Uh, so a lot of times, again, this this isn't really Monday morning quarterbacking. This is more just my lucid thoughts on on this whole idea of campaigns. But campaigns can sometimes they seem really cool, and a lot of times, you know, they add so much to the game. They add like a lot of nor narrative and you know the persistence from day to day and game to game as you play. And so it's going to create this cool story. You think of a game like Shadow War, or Frostgrave, or Gloomhaven, or Descent, or something like that. So it's going to add to the game. Where in this case, I felt like it's there. You know, it is adding stuff, but it just kind of diluted the rest of the game out to where it was like, when I'm actually playing, I don't really know what's going on. I just want to kind of level up my character. So maybe I would rather play something like, uh, oh, I'm thinking of role player. It's a game where you kind of roll up your character and that's it. Uh, so yeah, so again, this is a game though that I would maybe recommend because I think there's a lot of cool stuff happening, you know, uh, but it's just like, oof, I don't know. I just, when you could start to get to that questing phase, it just, it just kind of falls off a cliff for me. So that's near and far. Uh, now the last one is a side reel confluence. This is a game I have to admit I only played one time and they had a lot of interesting stuff. If I had to categorize this game, it would be basically Cosmic Encounter, but not the backstabbing stuff, just all the crazy special abilities. 
be like cosmic encounter with a euro trading economic thing instead of uh you know the cosmic encounter you know whatever that is so it has a lot of cool stuff there is a ton of asymmetrical special abilities and alien races and you're going through and kind of upgrading your civilizations your technologies and trading and converting them and getting bonuses off of them and kind of interacting with these different markets in these different ways and you have these you know ways that you can bid or you not bid and all of these special rules that are just going to change it up and i apologize my mechanics are not super fresh i only played it once and this was a couple of weeks ago before vacation <laughs> But this is the one game, this is why it's at the top of the list, that I would recommend people try. Now, for my money, there's a little bit too much going on for what you actually eventually pay off. Uh, so the one thing that I noticed is as we started to play through the game, you started to be able to kind of plan for uh, some of the, up, you know, the upcoming, uh, like the big achievement technologies that you could get. Once you kind of sort out what everybody can do and how they're going to interact in the different phases, and you can kind of watch people and see which sort of resources they're going for, because there's a ton of different kinds of resources, and there's a lot of resource conversion stuff that happens. And there's a real funky kind of timing thing with like a production phase and like a trading phase kind of thing. So once you kind of sort that out, then you can say, okay, well, I can get to here. I know Frankie over here, they're not going for that. Billy probably is. Francesca might be. da 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 and then you can kind of plan for that and you know have a backup plan and you can start to see what the value of the different resources are because there's not really i mean there is an intrinsic value because some resources are worth like three or th a third of the others and all that um but once you start to calculate all that it's just like a lot of paths that you have to sort of dive through and if you think of it like a point salad game it's not a point salad i guess well maybe it is but it's like a path salad like it's like okay i'm gonna sit here and stare at all these pieces and figure out how to get to that and that's going to give me 18 points and that's going to give me 19 points and okay da -da -da -da. okay i'm gonna go here and do that and then you're kind of sitting around waiting for everybody else to do that <laughs> and you end up at the end of the, the game you have a ton of cards everywhere different special abilities and stuff like that this is a very very unique game and it kind of reminds me of a game like, I've never played it, but like Vast, where you have like all those different asymmetrical powers, or one of those just weird niche games that's just off on its own, doesn't really kind of compare to a lot of other games. It's very much a mishmash of games. And I can 100% see a lot of people that like a heavy Euro or heavy economic game really getting into this and really pursuing it and really trying to get good at it and in and, and understanding you know which aliens are in play because there's a lot of different aliens to choose from understanding all those different special powers and really getting good at the game and getting into that on my side of it it's kind of like okay there's a lot of work to get there and by the time i'm like invested in that the theme itself just dissipates for me now it's you can see it there you can see the different mechanics and how they relate to the different races they kind of make sense how you operate like when i played i played like this plant race which is very very cool it's hard for them to kind of like space get spaceships and travel but you could sort of spin up and people kind of knew that so there were certain things that i needed 100 percent i had to get and even on the special player cards it tells you like you need to do this and this and this to start the game because it, I mean, the game knows that it's gonna, it would just be overwhelming and you could just be in a situation where if you didn't pay attention to that, you would just be not in a good place at all. You would be done. Uh, so it's very harsh in that say, way. But if you follow those, you'll be able to get going and other people can kind of play off of that dynamic. Like here, I'll give you these big yellow cubes. You know I need this ship or whatever. And so you can go off that. But again, it's just like the end result to me is not worth the journey is kind of where I'm coming down on that one. But this is the one I would probably recommend for sure folks try, especially if you like a heavy economic uh, euro. So that's side real uh, confluence. Is that how you say it? Si sidereal or side sidereal? I don't know. Side real confluence is how I'm going to pronounce it. So that's it. There's the eight games uh, that I've uh, blacklisted softly, I hope. <laughs> And uh, anyway, I'm excited now to uh, get back into doing some videos and doing some reviews and doing some 
I think I'll be doing some more playthroughs here because like I said, I've got a table. I can set up stuff. I can record. I can stop. I can leave everything up. I can leave the camera where it is, come back the next day or whatever, continue and be done with it. Uh, so look for some uh, more videos to kind of slowly start trickle out as I kind of get my steam up again. Uh, and we will end the podcast uh, like I've uh, promised and tried to traditionally do with a little bit of a pop culture thing. And while I was on vacation, I had a chance to go with my youngest son. We went to a place in uh, Hollywood called the Cinerama Dome. I believe it's called the Arclight Cinemas now, but they've kept the old facade of the Cinerama Dome. And that used to be a place where you could go, and I think there was only one or two theaters in there now. Now there's a whole bunch. It's a really kind of swanky theater. And the cool thing is they have some IMAX screens, but they also have these uh, 70 millimeter screens, which is just kind of a very, very wide screen. Uh, when I was younger, we went and saw Apocalypse Now. I was in high school, but we went and saw Apocalypse Now Redux, which was sort of like the director's cut of Apocalypse Now. Amazing, amazing. So we saw Dunkirk there, and it blew us both um, out of the water. And I highly recommend, I know it's been probably two months since that's been released in the theater, and they've been running that thing, I guess, all summer in 70 millimeter. When we went, there was maybe 10 people in the movies. Uh, I highly recommend you go see that in the movie theater. It doesn't have to be IMAX or 70 millimeter, but if you can, if you can find it, uh, you know, sometimes we call it here the dollar theater. The stuff will kind of trickle out of the main theaters and you can go watch it in the dollar theater. And uh, I would go to someplace like that even just to, just to see it kind of on a big screen. A very uh, well executed war movie. Now, if you don't like a war movie, you might still enjoy this. I mean, people don't like war movies for different reasons. Now, there's not a lot of gore in this. There's not like a lot of body parts flying around. I think there's one part where you see some, you know, some body parts. And that's not to say it's not intense and uh, and gut wrenching and all that stuff. It certainly is, but it's not over the top with the gore. And it has a really interesting way of telling the story of all of these men here on this beach that are trying to escape uh, these German bombers and get away and get back to uh, England. And they've been soundly defeated. And uh, and a lot of times you kind of forget, you know, where the war was at certain points because, you know, we know that the Allies eventually won and defeated Germany and, uh, and all those folks. And so you kind of, you know that, but you kind of forget like, okay, it wasn't like sunshine and roses all the way through. I mean, we kind of have rose tinted glasses when we, when we look at that, uh, when we look at that war, I think, well, I do. I mean, I, I think it's, maybe that's just me, but it's kind of like, Hey, we defeated Hitler and fascism. So hooray. And, you know, thank God for the, uh, you know, all the people that fought in that and helped out with that effort. Um, but there, the war takes place at a point where the morale is super low uh, with the English troops or the British troops. And the way it kind of tells the story of these different folks that kind of come together and come apart and sort of the time frame of it is really interesting. And I don't really want to kind of spoil the movie, but there's like one person that's a, a pilot, one that's kind of escaping on foot. There's some other folks coming in on uh, fishing vessels because a lot of the citizenry was engaged to send a fleet of ships to get in and get out and try to just, you know, hey, we can't move in these big ships and dock on this beach and get everybody off, so we've got to send in now the citizens and kind of commandeer their, their vessels for the Navy to take on just, you know, 50 guys or, or 20 guys at a time or whatever it is with whatever boats we got. So there's all these kind of stories that are kind of weaving throughout the whole uh, movie and some very human interactions and the musical soundtrack is great. So I, I really recommend uh, folks see this movie. Uh, it, you know, it was one of those things where my son and I were kind of speechless. And, uh, but we, you know, we talked a lot about it and stuff. So uh, very, very good movie. Highly recommend that. Okay, so that wraps up uh, number six for Drive Through FM. Uh, thanks for listening. And any feedback is appreciated. And have a good uh, fall. Summer's now almost over, and I'm very sad about that. I'm very much a summer person. <laughs> I'm not much of a winter person. I'm living in the wrong place. My vacation in Los Angeles, I'm from down there. That's where I grew up, uh, has reminded me of that yet again. So, anyways, so have a good day, everybody, and take care. <laughs>